my name is Erin Wells and I am currently the chair of the Public Library Division and um, this uh, webinar is in partnership with the State Library's monthly topic talks and so this is um, Centering Race in Library Reopenings Opportunities for Systems Change. Um, so I'll introduce our speaker uh, Sonia Urban. Um, she is the first, the, she works at Multnomah County Library, and she's the library's first equity and inclusion manager. She leads efforts to ensure library services, programs, staffing, materials, and spaces are equitable, inclusive, and culturally responsible. Her work in, involves leading staff through thoughtful discussions about equity and inclusion, and outlining actionable steps to improve the library's efforts both internally and for the community. She's also a liaison with the We Speak Your Language program and an executive sponsor of the Black Cultural Library Advocate for Staff. Prior to joining the library, she engaged in street and shelter outreach, working with community members experiencing houselessness, addiction, and mental illness. She brings this experience to the library with the goal of expanding the ways the library can fulfill its commitment to welcoming and serving those in our community experience the greatest barriers. Um, so welcome, Sonia. Um, I will turn this over to you. It looks like pretty much everybody is muted, but if you have not, please mute yourself and there will be time at the end of this for questions and answers. Thank you, Erin. Good morning, everybody. Um, Again, my name is Sonia, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I am uh, excited to be able to talk with you all and, and present uh, some information that we've been working on uh, with Multnomah County Library. Uh, I'm going to present, uh, and so I won't be able to see anybody. Normally I would have folks ask questions throughout and during if this was face-to-face, -face, but because of uh, sort of the technology challenges, um, I'm going to ask that folks hold questions or put questions in the chat. Uh, I also um, don't know if folks saw that we're gonna be doing progressive stacking around questions. So if you um, are one identify as, if you're a person of color and wanna identify as a person of color, if you uh, put two stars next to your name, we will be taking questions um, by folks of color first. So I'm gonna go ahead and start presenting. And um, let's see if this works here. All right. I'm going to ask if folks can see this. Somebody give me a yes or no. I can't see any of you. So if somebody can just let me know. We can, can see, see it. Perfect. OK. All right, so um, centering race in library reopening opportunities for systems change. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how we can center race, how we can center those most um, impacted as we reopen or as we restructure uh, in this time where many libraries have been closed, many libraries have really had to reshape uh, based on the COVID pandemic. So some community agreements I'm gonna ask folks to hold to. Again, progressive stacking. If you choose to identify as a person of color, please add two little stars next to your name. Uh, the three dots in the box, um, your box, you can add it there. You can just click on that and then rename. Uh, again, we're gonna take uh, chat questions from people of color first. The reason that we do this is because very often folks of color, um, their voices are not the ones that show up first or are heard uh, and can often get drowned out by dominant culture. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're uh, that I'm hearing the questions from folks who are living the experience first. I'm gonna ask folks to keep focused on the common goal, which um, my hope is that the fact that you're all here, you care about equity and inclusion, especially for those most impacted. Notice power dynamics in the space. So as we do get to more discussion, how are you using your privilege, taking up emotional space and airtime? Um, so really just uh, consider if, if you are somebody who sits in a position of power and privilege, um, how that shows up in this space. Uh, I want to make sure we're creating a space for uh, multiple truth and, truths and norms. I think about this like a statue. So if we were all sitting around a statue, we would all see something a little bit different. Um, so I may say, well, I see this, and you may not see the same thing. But that's because we're looking through different lenses. So really think about that there are multiple truths based on the lens that you come, fr come from and, and based on the lens that you're looking through um, that it's not right or wrong. 
Be kind and brave, speak your truth and be open to feedback, especially from those who own the experience. Uh, get okay with being uncomfortable. We don't change unless we're uncomfortable. Um, otherwise, there's no reason to. So, and look for listen and listen for learning. Not what you already know. Look for what you can learn. Um, so, what I want to do is start a little bit and just briefly talk about Oregon's history. Um, I don't know how much folks know about this, but it's really important that we look back to understand how folks of color um, have experienced and continue to experience Oregon. Uh, because Oregon was founded as basically a white refuge. It was um, founded where white folks came um, to get away from the problems of the day, which they saw as people of color and um, issues around people of color. So Oregon is often considered, you know, to be really progressive. Oregon did not have slaves, did not, you know, didn't, wasn't a, wasn't a slave state. Um, but the reality is, is that Oregon was anti-slavery and anti-black. So while there were, there were not slaves in Oregon. Oregon was also very clear that they did not want black folks um, in Oregon as well. And this shows up in exclusionary laws that, that Oregon had on the books um, for many, many years. And one of them was the Lash Law, which was enacted in um, 1844. And it uh, stated that any Three black folks who were here were uh, subjected to public beatings uh, twice a year until they left Oregon. So that clearly says that we, we don't want you here. Um, and again, not so progressive. Um, the second law that was enacted in 1849 was that there was a flat prohibition against blacks coming to Oregon. So basically, if you came to Oregon, you were a criminal. Um, and these exclusionary laws were written into the Constitution and um, actually, the, it, it, they were written into the Constitution, so it, it was the first, we were the only free state to come into the Union with an exclusionary clause. Um, and so why is this important? You know, this happened a long time ago. What does it mean now? But it still plays out. You know, the exclusion law, I don't know if folks know this, but it actually remained in Oregon's Constitution until 2001. So that's not that long ago. And folks fought to get the language out um, over and over again and over and over again, Oregon said, no, you know, it's part of our history. We want to keep it in. Well, what does that say to people of color? Um, when it did get voted uh, out, 31% of Oregon voters voted against the removal of the language. So a good number still wanted to see that language in there. Um, so it creates a current day legacy. There's a lack of trust um, based on the history um, and how that history has played out and continues to play out. If we think about redlining, there were some very strict redlining uh, laws, which now it's been replaced with gentrification. So Portland and other areas, um, and more and more areas where housing is becoming inaccessible to people of color. And so if people of color can't live in an area, um, then really it becomes an all white area again um, without the official laws. And then, you know, we've, uh, you know, it's the one of the whitest cities. It is the whitest city in America um, in comparison. And so there's a lot of implicit and explicit exclusion that happens. Micro and macroaggressions really create an unwelcoming environment for people of color. And particularly now we're seeing more and more emotional and physical racist violence um, overtly. And so it creates an environment where people of color are not comfortable, where people of color don't feel safe. So the history is really important to know because it continues to impact how folks use systems here, um, including the library. So centering race and reopening or restructuring. Um, one of the things that we realize is that during a crisis and, and during the crisis, this, this pandemic, um, it often shows us that we have resources that we didn't think we had. Right? We say we can't find places for folks to live. We can't find shelter for folks. Um, when in reality, when a crisis hits, we do have resources. We just have to shift them. So if we have them and we can do it, then it gives us an opportunity to do things differently. Um, so during this crisis, we really do, we've seen we have resources to be able to do different things and shift resources. So it's important that we look at doing that at this point in time if we're going to create a more equitable system during a crisis, then why would we go back after that? So 
the idea of returning to normal um, is not something we want to do. We actually want to create a new normal um, that allows the resources that we've shifted to continue and close the gap of equity, the equity gap that, um, that folks are experiencing. So why would we center race? Um, there's the recognition that the creation and perpetuation of racial inequities are baked into government and influence all systems. Um, we know that that's look, true across the country and, you know, certainly here in Oregon. Racial inequities across all indicators of su success are deep and pervasive. And focusing on racial equity provides an opportunity to introduce frameworks, tools, and resources that can also be applied to other folks in communities that are subjected to marginalization. Um, I want to talk a little bit about transactional and transformational change because what we're talking about in centering race is really a transformational change. And transactional changes are those activities, interactions, or processes that may support communities that are subjected to marginalization, but the benefits may be limited to individuals or groups and they don't have long lasting positive effects. They don't, they're not sustainable. Whereas transformational change is really changing the foundation of how systems function. Um, permanent change that benefits all members of group or, a group or groups. And um, it changes how we do the work moving forward. So it's, it's long lasting and sustainable. So I like to think about this um, in terms of building a house. And so if you think about building a house on a flawed foundation, so we know that the foundation of this country is fundamentally flawed. It is built on genocide, Jim Crow, colonization, slavery. So we have a flawed foundation in which we're building a house on. Um, and that house can help for a little while. It, it, you know, people can live in there and, and it provides shelter, but eventually the house is going to start to deteriorate. It's not going to last because the foundation isn't strong. Um, and so transactional change means we tear the house down, we build a new house, and we just keep going through that same process. Whereas transformational change is really what we need to do is we need to dig up the foundation and we need to build a new foundation um, that's strong, that is not flawed, and then build on top of that um, so that whatever we're building is much more strong, uh, sustainable, is stronger, and really supports, um, um, really supports the folks that are living in that, in, in that, that house or that home. So what does this mean for libraries? Um, it means that we use qualitative and quantitative data to determine which communities are most impacted by structural racism and oppression, both historically and through the current crisis of the pandemic and the racial violence. Um, one thing I'll say about this is a lot of times we, we look to numbers and as data. Um, there are a lot of communities that are not counted or not counted ac accurately. And qualitative data is just as important. Um, people's stories, people's stories tell us a lot about experiences and what is happening and how it's happening to folks and how we do things differently for, for those communities. Um, so really understanding that both qualitative and quantitative data is important. Um, we need to build our systems and structures or services to meet the needs of communities most impacted first. And those are community identified needs. Um, when we talk about, you know, creating systems and structures, we have to ask the folks that we're looking to serve because those communities know best, those mem the members of the community know how to do it. Um, if we try to do it for them, we will ultimately get it wrong. Um, and once in full and robust services are developed for the communities mo with the greatest need that are most impacted, um, then we look to develop services for other communities that may not be as impacted. Uh, so we sort of start with um, the greatest need, put in full services, and then move to the next level of, of need. So um, a framework towards this is really um, looking at what services are you providing. So in this case, we're looking at our virtual outreach and our in-location uh, services that we can provide safely. And we're starting with our BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and uh, other people of color to create services for those communities um, and looking at intersectionality, which is really important because if we look at intersectionality, then we're reaching BIPOC folks who are um, elders or who are differently abled or LGBTQ. Um, so once services are created there, then we look to other communities subjected to marginalization, um, build services there. And then the communities with the most resources that are least subjected to marginalization, that's 
sort of your last tier. That's the, the group that gets what's left. Um, so this is an example of sort of a priority one, how we would look at do, doing things. So virtual services, facilities, and outreach. Um, we would start with our BIPOC communities and our service models would prioritize those, those communities um, and in locations and outreach uh, to those communities. We then have to also look at, do we have culturally specific staff to meet the service models? Because it is certainly ideal to have folks from their own communities serving members of their community. Um, but we also have to consider, do staff feel emotionally and physically safe providing services? We know brown and black folks are at higher risk for COVID um, and for complications and death of COVID. We also know black and brown folks are at higher risk of violence, um, racist violence. So we have to think about and, and, and have conversations with our staff about how do we do this in a way that supports staff and community to feel safe um, during this time. And we need to then put in additional safety and security measures to make sure that our, our staff and communities feel safe in the services that we're providing. One of the things that I will say, if you have safety or security staff and you're going to be providing services to more uh, BIPOC communities, you really need to work with your safety staff to see where their bias lies. Um, because even, even very well-intentioned folks uh, may say, oh, you know, I treat everybody the same and, and that sort of thing. But we know that there is bias um, in everything we do. And, um, you know, we all have bias. And so uh, we need to train our staff to be rec recognizing their bias and make sure that they're providing um, um, safety and security in a way that is culturally sensitive and conscious. So when we talk about uh, levels of priority, this is what we are looking at um, in terms of our priority. But you want to determine and shift systems, evaluate and assess sort of where your region or area is um, and who's being most impacted by oppressive systems. So we're starting really looking with BIPOC folks, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, including intersectional identities. Um, then we would be looking at uh, people living in poverty, uh, language elders with intersectional identities, differently abled LGBTQ and intersectional identities, and then the last group that we would be putting resources towards would be dominant culture, financially privileged, and resource rich. So you sort of put full and robust services into the, um, the folks that need it the most. So how does this benefit um, communities, other communities that are experience oppressive systems? So systems created for those impact, um, most impacted benefit everybody. It's the idea of a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and services become easier to navigate. They're more accessible, they're more welcoming. And um, so those most in need benefit the most, and those who have the least need benefit the least. So everybody benefits, but just at different levels. And then this is how we begin to um, close the gap, gap of inequity that uh, we have been in and continue to experience, and it's getting greater through these times. So I want to talk a little bit about the reality of centering race in a racist environment, because um, it's not easy. It's very challenging and, and there are a lot of things that folks will, will have to deal with. So I think one of the first questions is how committed are you to really centering race in an environment that we know is not always welcoming to do that. Uh, so you have to be willing to take risks and stand firm against pushback. Um, if you're questioning your commitment or your ability to stand against, uh, you know, stand against pushback, um, if you're not willing to put it as a priority in the work, or it's less of a priority as it gets difficult, I, I personally, I think that you don't do it. It leads to tokenism and community trauma. So you have to be really willing to do this and, and, and be willing to stand firm in what comes from it. Um, are you willing to let your communities lead? So the communities most impacted, are they leading the work? Are they telling you what they need? Are you taking that and, um, that feedback and allowing it to guide you in what's created. Um, 
Also, those who support your library may be less likely to support it if you're centering race and shifting resources um, that folks who have a lot of privilege are used to. Uh, so your support could be impacted by that. And I think that that's something that is important to know and decide where are you in that if, if support is withdrawn from maybe many of the folks that, that fund you and, and, and allow your services to, to continue. So I want to talk a little bit about, about a both and win-win situation scenarios, like how can you do this work um, that may not quite center race but can still support communities. Um, this, these scenarios do not center, lead with, or put racial justice or social justice first, and they are in opposition to true racial equity work and racial justice. Um, and the reason they're in opposition is because it gives folks an out. Um, centering and leading with race requires people in positions of power, usually white folks, to share power. This can be difficult when you've not had to do this, um, but need to do it in order to center the work. Centering and leading with race requires people to be aware and check their own power and privilege. That can be really uncomfortable. Um, but with a both and, uh, and or a win-win scenario, um, they don't benefit the most impacted. These are transactional changes um, that you can make. So there are ways to make changes, but they will be transactional. Um, so because we know everything's racism and oppression is embedded in every system. Um, if you're thinking about making change, if you're thinking about serving communities most oppressed, and you know that you know, support will be lacking for that, um, you can think about how can I do this and still get support? And this is a real tough, for me, me personally, a real tough thing because sometimes we have to provide services to those with the most resources in order to continue to get funding and services to be able to provide for those with less. And again, it doesn't center race, it's not true equity, but it is a way to still provide services. So thinking about does continuing to provide those beloved dominant culture services provide continued support to your library that allows for resources to serve groups subjected to marginalization um, you can consider gradual shifting of services from dominant culture to culturally specific and responsive services so that it's not as apparent, it's, it, it doesn't feel as jarring to folks who, who have more privilege and may be upset by that. Uh, you can educate your community on racism and equitable systems and the need to center BIPOC folks, Black and Indigenous people of color. Um, and, you know, does this move you towards the greater good? So as an equity person, I'm always going to push for not a both and win-win, we have to center, but I also am realistic in the work that sometimes the greater good is that we have to um, do it in a different way that um, in order to continue to provide services to, to other folks. So can this work in uh, libraries of different sizes and different levels and resources? Absolutely. What you're talking about is prioritizing the commu um, those communities that are most impacted where you are. And so this can be done. Actually, smaller libraries may even be easier to do this, um, to be able to say, OK, we're going to look at shifting our systems um, and center race, center folks who are mar uh, marginalized. I want to talk a little bit about racial accountability, because accountability is really important as we're doing this work. Um, so racial accountability is creating processes and systems that are designed to help individuals and groups to be held in check for their decisions and actions and for whether the group, uh, the work being done reflects and embodies racial justice principles. So it's important that those in power, those with the highest levels of privilege and power are accountable for actions related to equity and inclusion in our library systems. Equity can easily drop off priority in favor of mainstream and easier choices and decisions. Uh, so leadership needs to be accountable to community staff and yourselves uh, in the work. And some of the ways that you can do this in terms of institutional community relationships are that you can support, initiate, and expand anti-racism, anti-oppression work in the library and community. Uh, you can deepen the understanding of white folks of systemic oppression and white privilege in your library and community. 
and you can learn and understand the library's relationship to the history of oppression in your area, in the county, in the country, um, and how that has impacted library use for folks. In terms of um, uh, racial accountability and interpersonal relationships, some of the things that you can do are um, show up, speak up, and challenge oppression, racism, and white privilege. Commit, commit to building relationships and trust and accountability with people of color. Be open to diverse forms of work styles, leadership, and communication. And this one's really important because we work in a, a framework of a white supremacy culture. And so if we have diverse staff, um, we often expect them to fall in line with how they do the work, um, how they show up to work, and we often expect that in, in the framework of characteristics of white supremacy. Commit to listening and learning and receiving feedback openly and without defensiveness. Honor the experiences and the cultural expressions of others and be respectful when stating our own beliefs, needs, and feelings. Invite other people to join, uh, join you in the work. This is really important. People of color have been and continue to work day in and day out. Um, and it's not our job to dismantle white supremacy systems um, created by white folks and sustained by people in power, uh, white folks who sit in positions of power. Uh, be uncomfortable and stay present even when it's difficult. So what else can you do? Um, educate yourself, begin to recognize your own bias, power and privilege. There's a lot of information out there there's a lot of ways that you can educate yourself. Do not ask people of color to do the work or educate you or others. Um, it's not our job. Set expectations uh, for your leadership team around addressing uh, systemic racism and oppression. So are you having regular conversations? Do you expect your leadership team to uh, really be taking this work on and, and held accountable for the work? Evaluate your programs, policies, and service models through an equity lens. There's a number of different equity lens models out there um, that you can use to run through and see how do your programs, how do your policies impact uh, folks that are differently situated. And be willing to be uncomfortable and stand firm in your commitment to those impacted with the greatest barriers. So those are some of the things that you can do. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, probably say, open up for discussion, um, questions. I don't know if any questions came in the chat. I couldn't see any of you. Um, but open it up for questions or if uh, whoever was monitoring the chat can let me know if there are questions that are coming in. And again, we'll we'd like to take questions from folks of color first. Uh, this is Darcy. And I just wanted to let you know, we haven't had any questions yet. Um, so we'll go ahead and see um, if uh, you would put your questions in the chat to help us moderate a little bit. That would be great. And I guess because I'm also open for discussion, there's a lot of folks, um, but just to have some discussion around like what do folks think about this? What is it, you know, what are your questions? Is it doable, not doable? What do you see as benefits, the barriers? I'm wondering, Sonia, is there a, an example that you can give us from Multnomah County, maybe one of the first programs or services that you started shifting um, to support that work? Um, so maybe a practical example would be helpful. Sure. So one of the things that we um, are doing right now is that we have a grant that we got from Meyer Memorial Trust and our library foundation to, it was originally to serve, um, to, to do pretty intensive community engagement with the black community around um, kindergarten readiness, early childhood kindergarten readiness. And so we developed a steering team of Seven, about 17 culturally specific providers serving the African and African American communities. Uh, and we were going to then engage the community, but uh, the pandem pandemic hit. So we went to the funders and asked if we could shift our, you know, what, what, what the focus and the scope is. And they said, yes. So we had the community providers um, identify what the greatest needs are based on what they're seeing in their, their communities and who they're serving. Um, and 
So they came up with sort of four buckets of areas that the community, the black community needs most. And a big part of it is focusing around um, school, families with school-aged youth because of uh, the switch to online learning and the digital divide. And so we have our Black Cultural Library Advocates staff that are involved in that, and we're looking at expanding that and bringing more of our Black Cultural Library Advocates staff, it was a small group, into that um, to work with the community to design what the community needs and what they're saying that they need. And so the idea is that that engagement will ideally shift how we do engagement and program development moving forward. Um, and with our black staff who are part of the communities, um, be able to design the services. Um, it's not for us as a library to say, oh, well, the, this is what we're gonna give you. It's for the community to say, this is what we need and how we need it. So we're in process right now of um, sort of coming up with plans based on working with the community of how we're gonna shift our, our services um, and what we're providing. And then, you know, that's in and of itself is transactional, but the idea that then this continues, these are not isolated things, this continues even beyond, you know, full reopening of, of our library, um, that we would not go back to other ways of functioning with communities. Uh, so one question we have, um, are there any suggestions on how we can find out more about our BIPOC community since the data that's probably more readily available isn't really representative? What are some other ways? Yeah, you know, it's, it's tough in this environment because I would say talk to folks, you know, host, host groups. So you could host forums. Um, and again, I'm, I would say be cautious about doing this because if you're not going to take the feedback, then it's not a good idea. But if you are, then hosting forums like this, but also recognizing there's a digital divide in our communities of color, so it's going to be tougher. Um, there are a lot of studies out there. I mean, I think we work with the Coalition for Communities of Color um, with our grant, and there's a lot of data that they're pulling quanti quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, go to the, another way to do it is, is who are the natural leaders in the community and have conversations with them, you know, and, and natural leaders may not be the folks running the program, you know, running the services or, or the CEO of, of an organization, executive director. Who are the leaders, who are the natural leaders and have conversations, reach out to them and, um, those are the folks who have the information. I think those are some great ideas. And I do, I um, agree that if you're gonna ask for feedback, you better at least pick one thing from that feedback and act on it. Otherwise you, you're just gonna damage your credibility. And as you said earlier, damage uh, the participants and it's just another form of trauma for them. Uh, so it, it's um, good to follow up. Uh, so uh, we have two more questions. The first one is, um, could you share an example of a both and or win-win example that you've seen that works in libraries, I think? So a more practical one so they can make that transact, you know, that initial transactional type mm -hmm. of change. Sure. So um, one of the things, so what, what we have done in our library is we open for curbside service. And the reality is curbside service does not center race. Right, we, we, we know that folks who are picking up their holds, who are putting stuff on hold, probably are not um, a lot of our brown and black folks in the community. Um, the reality is, is that we have a community that votes to decide what our, you know, what our budget is and what our, you know, what, what resources we have. And so while it doesn't center race, and, and again, this is, this is tough for me, but the bigger picture is if we can provide curbside service and by providing that we can have the resources over here to do things like the grant and serve you know, black and brown communities in culturally specific ways, then you know, that's, that may be what we need to do. And that's what we, we, we have done. Um, 
And it's real hard. I would say, you know, if you've got folks of color, staff and community, it's going to feel not okay, you know. Um, and if you have equity people and, and you know, it, it's, it's not the way we want it. But it's also sometimes looking at the greater good in the moment to say, how do we, can, how do we make sure we can provide the services to people who need them most? Because otherwise we're looking at potentially not being able to provide any services. So yeah, it's, it's a tough line. Uh, another question is, um, would you be willing to provide some examples of how those who benefit from white supremacy can share their privilege with um, BIPOC folks? Yeah, I mean, you know, folks who benefit, I, I think, first off, letting communities of color lead, right? So we know what we need. We know where we need it. So we tell you what we need and you carry it out, right? There are a lot more white folks in the room than people of color, you know, who have that privilege and power. So are you listening to the people who are most impacted and then are you taking that into the rooms, the decision-making rooms, right? Because white folks, I mean, honestly, when it comes to a lot of power, white folks listen to white folks. So white folks can educate other white folks. Like once you, you educate yourself and then educate others, call out. Um, don't leave it to the person of color in the room to call out when somebody engages in a micro or macro aggression or says something that's you know, insensitive or, or isn't centering um, communities of color and ask like every decision that's being made every conversation what about people most impacted what about our brown and black community what about our brown and black staff how does this impact them um one of the questions that that comes that is in uh the equity lens and equity you know most equity lens is who benefits and who burdens by this decision and so the folks that are in those rooms speak up ask the questions Great, I, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, Carrie, I just wanna share a comment from Carrie. She mentioned that she's heard from about a library system that in its low income neighborhoods provides a circulating collection but doesn't allow holds because they recognize that many individuals in the community do not have computer and internet access and thus they're not able to place holds at all. Uh, so I think that's a great example of just reframing the service completely so that people that are um, don't have access can be first in line, so to speak. Uh, another question from Stephanie is, do you have a specific equity lens that you recommend for libraries? Um, I don't have one specifically. Multnomah County, we're part of Multnomah County and they created uh, the equity and empowerment lens. You know, a, a lot of the lenses are, a lot of information um, and can take a really long time to do. Um, so I've done some, I've taken that information and, and shortened them for depending on the decision. I think if you're looking at totally reframing, you wanna look through a full equity lens and do all of those hundreds of pages of work. Um, but as simple as asking who's at the table, who benefits, who's burdened, um, and thinking about communities most impacted, black and brown communities, um, folks living in poverty, differently abled, and how does this decision impact those different groups? You know, how does it, how does it benefit or how does it burden? And who's at the table telling you that, right? Because if it's a bunch of folks who aren't part of that community and don't have that experience deciding how it impacts, it's not gonna be real beneficial. So I know Seattle has some great uh, models. Multnomah County has a great model. Um, and I would say you could just start with who's at the table and how does this benefit and how does this, who does this benefit and who does this burden? Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, wondering about the house and foundation analogy that you presented on. Would you say, could you say more about what you mean by replacing the foundation? Um, the things you listed in the foundation are realities of the foundation of, in our country, right? So, um, so every house we build now will in, real, will in reality be built on that same foundation. So really, how do we create that completely new foundation? Yeah, well, I say we tear it all down and start new. Revolution, let's have a revolution, but that's just me. Um, 
Yes, it is true that, you know, everything is embedded in the system, but I think when we start to do pieces of it, so for instance, with the, the um, services that we're looking to provide to black and brown communities, the communities are leading those. And we're committing to saying, if we're going to create, create services, those services are going to be built by and, and you know, with communities most impacted. That's a different foundation. Um, you know, it's not the full foundation, but it's a piece of the, a different foundation for that community um, or those communities that we haven't done before. You know, before we would be like, we're gonna give these services to the black community, as opposed to really engaging and saying, we are going to change how we find out what services are needed and how they need to be provided. So that's a foundational change that we can make while still knowing that we're, you know, if, if we can't get rid of the system totally, we can start to, to chip away at it and build smaller foundations around it that we can build off of that are, are stronger. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to go ahead and share a comment from someone at Multnomah County mm -hmm. um, saying that many of the folks there are struggling to understand how our system is centering rates and responding to the current crisis. So thanks for noting the issues with curbside service not centering race. Uh, staff have been denied the opportunity to deliver outreach to homeless shelters using existing resources, for example. I'm a white staffer trying to understand how to center race in my work in the face of constant chorus of, quote, wait, unquote, and silence from system leaders. Um, do you want to comment or maybe provide some uh, advice that, you know, kind of going back to that concept of maybe leading at every level? So what can a staff person do to kind of refocus Mm -hmm. uh, the efforts and services. Yeah, so I, you know, I want to acknowledge we are going through layoffs right now um, in our library. So it's a very difficult time for folks. Um, and we are trying to figure out what's, like, how do we rebuild and center the folks that we say we're centering, like, you know, with race. Um, so we are working towards that but it also, we, there's an urgency, but we also need to make sure we're getting staff input, you know, to create the, like we can't, we can't just throw things together. Um, and so we need staff input. And I mean, very honestly, given where we are in, um, that we're facing layoffs and staff are emotionally exhausted and impacted and not just by, you know, the virus and the layoffs, but the racial violence. Um, that it has, you know, asking folks to participate now, particularly people of color it, during this short period of time um, can be difficult. Folks are exhausted. So my, my framework and my focus is that we continue to push forward. We continue to say we're going to do this um, and we go through the process we're going through now, and then we say, we look at, okay, we need to stand up services for communities of color, um, and we need to involve the people that, that can help us do that, that can lead, lead those efforts. So it's, it, it is difficult, yeah. And, and, you know, we're not perfect, and we're not, you know, we, we certainly missed centering race we, early on, um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another uh, question. Uh, one of the places we would like to start in doing this work and centering race in our services is doing EDI audits of our collections. Do you or does anyone else here have resources they would be willing to share regarding evaluating our collections for equity? I don't have any specific. Our collections we have done or we, we were starting to do uh, uh, evaluation around our collections for our youth collections, um, children's books, and the Native community. And we had gotten a lot of input from the community. We had a lot of information from the community, and then it got put on hold given, you know, where we are. Um, but there are things out there. We do have folks who have done some of that. 
you know, one of the things that we, we have, which I really appreciate with, with Multnomah County, is we have the Black Cultural Library Advocates and we speak your language folks who can really help to support and call out if a book isn't, you know, these are, the, these are the ones that are probably better. These are the ones that may not be. These are things that we should be, we should be purchasing and have available. Um, and it's a balance, you know, the, the whole idea of intellectual freedom um, and equity don't always feel right, right? We've got some books that are clearly, um, I don't want to see, uh, but intellectual freedom says that we have books for everybody, right? So when you're looking at that and, and as you're not taking books off the shelf because of intellectual freedom, the idea is we, we build up those culturally responsive, culturally specific, culturally appropriate collections and, and then minimize the other ones. Great. Um, and then it was also mentioned in the chat that ALA has, some good, has a good course on doing equity audits. So that may be another resource. Um, I want to make a point of um, encouraging uh, people of color to participate. So far, we've been hearing mostly from the dominant, almost, ex uh, ex well, as I can base on the chat names. So I'm making an assumption there. But I do want to make sure that um, people who would like to speak up have an opportunity to do so, uh, either with questions or suggestions or anything else that comes to mind. Yeah, please. I'm one person, you know, I've got my lens. I live and breathe this work. Um, but certainly, you know, there's, I'm, I don't pretend to know it all. Um, and I make mistakes regularly too. So. Great. Um, we have a comment here that Multnomah County Libraries Youth Services Department has been doing a diversity os has been doing diversity audit work and training. They uh, did a three-part training with School Library Journal uh, in the spring 2019 and was in process of carrying out this work. So there um, could be some uh, resources in that issue of uh, School Library Journal, if I understand. And then also the yeah School Library Journal course was one that she was thinking of. So great. Thanks for sharing those resources. Yeah, there's a lot that folks are doing that I don't even know about. I mean, you know, we're, we're a large system. I'm one person. I don't know at all, uh, everything that's happening. I can say our youth services have done amazing work around equity and looking at a scorecard to determine who gets services and what schools get services based on need. Um, so they have done a lot of work um, and kind of taken that and run with it with youth services. So they, they've done an amazing job all around in, in the services that they're providing and the way they're looking at things. Other questions or comments? Ah, some good, uh, another resource being shared in the chat. And I'll make sure that anything uh, that's in the link will be shared online. Uh, Equity in Action, Building Diverse Collections. Uh, is the library journal uh, resource. And then um, uh, Dandelion mentions that you have told our staff about a report card of some kind of executive management. Can you tell us a bit more about those plans? Yeah, so um, we're in the process right now of coming up with, I've come up with just a, a framework for our executive management to hold us accountable to the work. So it basically, um, is a scoring, has a scoring mechanism to it that looks at the priorities, you know, our new priorities that we stated uh, that center those who are most impact, have been most impacted by COVID. Um, does it center race? Have staff been engaged in the process? Um, where is it in the process? And like, what's the initiative? So we are discussing it now to determine like, are we looking at do we look at every initiative? We do, do we look at sort of executive, like program, full organizational initiatives? So we actually just had a conversation about that on Wednesday. We're hoping to finalize it um, to, to sort of decide what we're going to be looking at. Um, but the idea is that we need to be, executive team needs to be accountable to the work. We've said um, we're centering race. We said that it's a priority. And so we need to be accountable to, to that work. So that's, that's in process and, and being worked on. 
Great. Any other questions? Um, we are rounding the top of the hour. I do want to be respectful of uh, people's time if they need to leave for a meeting coming up at 11. So we probably have time for another question or two or comment. As you see my kid wandering <laughs> through the back there. <laughs> Hello, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, teleworking. Great. All right. Okay, we have any thoughts on uh, job requirements and requirements such as um, an MLIS, for example, so as barriers, right, to employing a more diverse staff? Yep. Um, I think it's a huge barrier. I, I think that, um, you know, we've got folks, yeah, you know, it, it education is an issue from you know early early on and and for communities of color and that's not about the communities that's based in racism and, and white supremacy culture and how children of color are viewed um i think you know i, I think if we shift to thinking about how do we pro how do we connect with communities Right, and there's a lot of folks that can connect with communities. So the idea that you have to be in a certain classification to do certain work, I, I would love to see that expanded. You know, if we've got somebody that is working in locations um, and predominantly doing, you know, um, in location work around shelving and, and pulling holds and that sort of stuff, those are the same folks who'd be amazing at outreach, right? And connecting with communities. So. I really think, um, and I know that my boss, uh, Bailey, she has had a lot of conversations and been in a lot of conversations around the barriers um, for folks of color. I think the fact that we have positions that are specifically designated to have part of their time work with communities, uh, the members of their own community has helped um, because then we're looking for folks who have lived experience and expertise within the communities. So that, that I, I believe has helped us in being able to, to diversify and really get folks who, who can connect. But it is an issue, yeah. Yeah, having the credentials as opposed to the skills, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, education, formal education, I, I'm, not a, I'm not big on formal education. I, I think, you know, lived experience is as important, if not more important. Um, and if you have the skills, you've got the skills. Exactly, right. Well, I do want to wrap things up. It seems like we've had some great questions. So I want to thank everyone who's been participating. And I especially want to thank Sonia for her time today. Thank this you. has been a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn. So again, thank you. Um, and if there's any other closing comments people want to make, lots of thank yous for you, Sonia. Uh, found the val discussion valuable and really lifted her soul this morning. So that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, there was, oh, I missed a question. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a question. Are there any thoughts or plans regarding how layoffs disproportionately affect BIPOC staff uh, that were recently hired? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we know it's, we're, we're a union system. We know that it is based in seniority. Um, you know, we do have our KSA positions, our culturally specific positions. So you know, it, it, for a person to get bumped out of that position, they can only get bumped by somebody else who has the same skill set. Um, but we, uh, yes, yes, we know. Um, and I, I, again, I wish if it was up to me, we'd change the system, right? Um, but we are working in, in an environment that does utilize seniority and that um, does not benefit folks who have and continue to be most impacted. Yeah. So we are looking yeah. at ways to see, you know, how can we, we, we set up more services uh, so that our culturally specific staff, you know, we, we clearly are gonna need folks, our, our culturally specific staff for the services that we say we're providing. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you all so much uh, today. And thank you again, Sonia. Uh, it's been a pleasure yep, and you. a wonderful learning experience. So, 
I am. Um, we'll go ahead and sign off now, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.